Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? These are working. Okay. If I start to get too quiet or if these stop working, just wave at me because I want to make sure we can hear what's being said here. You guys haven't heard much from me yet. My name is Brenda Larkin. I represent George Allen Kelly. And that's who I want to talk to you about today because the state talks a lot here today about what they say happened on January 30th of last year. And I want to talk about everything that led up to that incident so that you have an idea and you can put that incident into context when you're actually hearing the evidence. And the evidence is going to describe some of Mr. Kelly's background. The evidence is going to show that Mr. Kelly is born in the Carolinas. He grew up always in rural areas. He's always hunting. He's always fishing, mostly fishing. That's his life ever since he's a young boy. And he goes to college, graduates college. He marries Wanda, who's his high school sweetheart. And they start a life together, he and his wife. Mr. Kelly works with fish and wildlife for a very long time. It allows him to be outdoors. It allows him to be in nature. It allows him to be close to the things that he loves and doing the things that he loves. Eventually, he and Wanda decide to move to Montana because he takes a job out there and the trout fishing in Montana is the best in the whole world. That's why he wants to be there. He winds up working for Fish and Wildlife on um, an Indian reservation and working with the tribe that's out there. Eventually, the state takes over the tribal land and his job no longer exists for him out in Montana. He's offered positions in different places, but all of those positions are desk jobs in a city, which to him is just not something that he can do. So he and his wife decide to stay in Montana and they open up a lodge. They open up an Orvis Lodge that involves taking people on guided trips to go fishing, to go hunting, and they operate that as a family for many, many years. He and his wife have two sons. The sons help work on the lodge as well, and they're all very happy. Wanda's a school teacher. Mr. Kelly really, really likes living in Montana. <coughs> Wanda thinks it's too cold, and Wanda has always wanted to move to Arizona ever since she was a child. She saw pictures of Arizona in a book, and that was her dream. So she and Alan, and I'm going to call him Alan. He's George Alan Kelly, but Mr. Kelly is his father, and nobody calls him George. So if I call him Alan, that's who I'm talking about. Alan and Wanda made a deal. Alan said to Wanda, if you come with me to Montana, and if you live here for as long as we can for our career, for my career, and if you support me, then after a certain amount of time, I'll move with you to Arizona. And eventually, Wanda holds him to that, and they come to Arizona. They first go through Flagstaff, but Wanda sees snow, so they have to keep going further south. And eventually, they wind up down in southern Arizona. They don't purchase the property where he's at right away. They have some other ranching property nearby that's in a different location at first. But eventually they purchase the property where this incident took place. And they purchased that property many, many years ago. I believe 20, 20 or so years ago is when they actually purchased that property. So he and Wanda have been out there for a very long time. They had to build their house there. They had to fence the, the whole property in order to put cattle on the property to run their ranch. And they've been living there ever since. It's the dream home, and that's where they want to be. Alan, not being from here and never living close to the border, never really knew anything about illegal immigration. It just wasn't something that was in his mind when he came down here. He had his first experience, his first encounter ever with illegal immigrants when he was putting up fence posts trying to fence his property. He and a couple of folks were helping him build the fence and he describes stumbling upon a group of people. And he didn't really know what was happening. He'd never encountered something like this before. But he saw this group of people. The group of people looked scared when he and his workers ran into them. And he just remembers in the moment thinking, this is, this is strange and they look scared. So he said, esta bien. Just, but he has limited Spanish now, but he knows how to tell them it's okay. 
And his first impression, he, he was confused, and the folks who were helping him build his fence tell him, oh, those are, those are illegal aliens. That's, that's what you just saw. And so he had to start learning about what that was. That was never something that he'd ever encountered before. And he describes that first encounter as very heartbreaking to him. He, he saw people, and he saw families, and he saw that people were hurting. He saw that people were desperate, and he saw that people were scared. And that was the first, the first impression he had of illegals on his property. And he's building the fence. He hasn't put any wire up yet. He learns that it's likely there will be more such people who are coming across his property. And he thinks, well, I mean, that's not, that's not great, but what can I do about it? And so he purchases some smooth wire. For the fence. The top strands of the, on the fence are barbed wire, the bottom wire is smooth wire. Because he knows if people are going to be coming through, he at least doesn't want anybody to get hurt. Over the years, and again, it's many years he's on this property, over the years he sees some more things start to transpire. He doesn't see people close up very frequently. He sees people from a distance if he sees people at all. He sees people who are family groups, and he knows they're family groups because they're people who are men, who are women, who are children, all sort of traveling together. In the early days, everybody's wearing ordinary clothing, so no different from the clothing you might see if you just walk around outside today. And in the early days, he doesn't encounter very many problems, and he doesn't feel afraid. He feels these people are actually more afraid of me than I am of them, because they run. When they see me, they get scared. He starts to pick up on, as he goes out, and he goes out every day on his ranch. He's a cattle rancher. He's out there every day. He sees trails. He sees tracks. He sees different signs throughout the day, every day, of people coming through his property. He sees what he describes as campsites, meaning a place where people stay for longer, perhaps past the night. In these areas, he finds water bottles, he finds clothing, he finds discarded food items, all sorts of things just to tell him, even though I didn't see people, I know people were here because here's signs of people being here. And he learns over the years where these sites are. And over the years, as he's out on his property, if he happens to have a water bottle with him, he'll leave a water bottle at one of those sites because he doesn't want anything bad to happen to anybody on his property. He's a compassionate man, and he, he doesn't want people on his property, but he understands that people have their own lives and they're trying to do something out of desperation. He starts to communicate with Border Patrol. These ranches that are on the border have a program called a Ranch Liaison Program. And that program involves a person, the Ranch Liaison, whose job it is to connect with these ranchers on the border, establish rapport, establish communication with them, in order that this rancher who's out here in this vast area can have somebody to access, to talk to whenever something, something happens or whenever something is seen. And so over the years, Mr. Kelly becomes familiar with a number of ranch liaisons who cycle through that position. He reports things to the ranch liaison that he sees. He's told by the ranch liaison, you know, if it's a criminal issue, you can call 911. If it's a border issue, so if there's an issue with any kind of illegal immigration on your property, call the ranch liaison. The ranch liaison also sends information to the ranchers. So if the ranch liaison is aware that there's a big group of people in a certain area, if it's near a ranch, the ranch liaison will communicate that to the rancher to say, here's a heads up, I'm letting you guys know there's this number of people in your area, things of that nature. If Mr. Kelly were to ever see a helicopter circling his property, for example, and he doesn't know what's going on, he calls the ranch liaison because that's whose helicopter that is and they're going to know what's going on and they'll inform him of what's going on. 
So Mr. Kelly establishes this relationship and this rapport with Border Patrol over the years. He learns over the years that the response time to his property is not necessarily very fast. So if he calls somebody, he might not get somebody out there for 15 minutes or something like that. And by that time, whoever was there is gone. Whatever he saw is no longer there. That's just the nature of reality on the ground for Mr. Kelly out there. This is all pretty fine and dandy for many, many years. And then things start to change. Mr. Kelly starts to see different things. He's not seeing as many family groups anymore. Mr. <laughs> Kelly starts to see individuals carrying backpacks. Men, always men, carrying backpacks and going along the fence lines. He knows that these are individuals engaged in illegal activity because when they see him, they run away. Still, people run away from him. And then things change. And things change in a very dangerous and a very frightening way for Mr. Kelly and for his wife. Mr. Kelly starts to see larger groups and he starts to see larger groups of all men carrying large backpacks. At first, he doesn't see any weapons, but he's seeing a difference. These aren't the same family groups that he saw when he first started living on this property. This is something else. He talks to the ranch liaison. They communicate with him. He learns that there's drugs in this area. There's human trafficking in this area. There are other things going on besides family groups coming through here. The ranch liaison communicate with Mr. Kelly eventually, and they never used to say this before, but they start to say, there's a group in your area, be careful. Don't try to stay, if, if while there's this group in this area, don't go out. They communicate different messages like that. It used to be you run into a group of people, it's no problem. People might be scared, they might be afraid that you'll report them or something, but this is different. Something has changed. Now there's more fear coming from Mr. Kelly and from his wife. He doesn't know anymore who he's going to run into when he's out on his property. And eventually, over the years, he has a couple encounters where he starts to see weapons. He sees, again, these groups of men carrying backpacks, and this time he'll see a rifle, maybe two rifles. Things start to get much more dangerous. This isn't what it used to be. On at least one occasion, somebody takes a shot at Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kelly gets fired at on at least one occasion. On that particular occasion, Mr. Kelly didn't have a rifle with him. He had his pistol with him, which he carried with him a lot, but he didn't have a rifle. And the person who fired the shot was so far away, his pistol would be ineffective. So Mr. Kelly dropped down into the grass and he waited and he hoped. He hoped that nothing further was going to happen. And he stayed there for about 15 minutes before he was able to gather himself and come in. Over the years, he's reported a number of incident, incidents to law enforcement involving either seeing people or hearing shots, being approached by people, those sorts of things. Over the years, he's made a number of reports. And typically, the report gets investigated. Law enforcement comes. They take Mr. Kelly's statement. They can't find anyone because they took too long for them to get out there, people are gone anyway, and nothing happens other than he's able to report it. But because of this heightened level of danger and this heightened level of risk, Mr. Kelly starts to feel unsafe <coughs> on his property. And he knows when he goes out, he needs to be armed to protect himself. He also chooses to be armed as a deterrent. He hopes that if people see him, and if they see that he's carrying a rifle, they will leave him alone. And then nothing has to happen. No encounters have to take place. Mr. Kelly does not wish for a violent encounter. This is some of the background.
coming from Mr. Kelly and his wife. You'll hear them talk about these types of things and what's going on on their property. You're also going to hear from a number of different Border Patrol agents who have experience out in that property and in that general area and who know the area. Border Patrol knows what's going on out there. They know which types of people are out there and what they're doing. And this is an area, Mr. Kelly's Ranch is about one and a half miles north as the crow flies from the border wall. And you're going to hear something called the end of the wall. You're going to hear that described by witnesses in this case. One and a half miles south of Mr. Kelly's property is the international border between the United States and Mexico. And there's a wall out there, and then it ends. There's a, a very tall wall. It's metal. It has razor wire on top. It's, it's pretty big and pretty imposing, pretty difficult to climb over or get around. And then it just stops. That wall just stops. And after that, there's a, a little barbed wire fence, and there's what are called Normandy barriers, which are sort of metal crisscross things that will stop a vehicle, but they won't stop people. And so you're going to hear that the walls can be effective in moving traffic. So traffic that might come through closer to Nogales now has to move further out and come across here where the wall ends, which is right near Mr. Kelly's property. And so this is a corridor. Mr. Kelly's property is in a corridor of illegal traffic. And you'll hear that that illegal traffic includes human smuggling and drug smuggling. You'll hear that there are different sort of jobs, I suppose, or positions involved with this illegal traffic. There are scouts and their guides, who are people who are working to facilitate both human and drug smuggling. So a scout is a person who's going to typically be stationed at a high point on a mountain with binoculars, who can survey an area visually. They're typically wearing camouflage, typically trying to conceal themselves. And they have a radio with them so that they can see where a border patrol is, they can see where a group is that might be going through for whatever reason, they can see where the pickup point is, and they can relay this information on the radio to the bad guys on the ground who are trafficking the people or trafficking the drugs through the area. You're also going to hear that out there there are guides or coyotes. But the coyotes are the guides, and those are the folks who are guiding groups of people through this area. A guide will have a radio. A guide might be listening on the radio to a scout or to somebody else. A guide will be responsible for bringing either people or people who are carrying drugs or just people to a certain location. You're also going to hear that there are other groups out there that are called either rip crews or bandits, depending on which term you prefer. But there are groups of people out there who try to take advantage of the illegal traffic that's going on. These are people who might confront somebody who's carrying drugs with weapons, steal the drugs from the person who's carrying drugs. These are people who might confront these migrant groups and rob them because this type of crime doesn't really get reported. If somebody's a migrant and they're in here, they're very vulnerable. If the bad guys go and rob them, it's not frequent that that's reported. So this is just the general character of the type of crime that's happening in this rural area that's out east of Nogales, very near Mr. Kelly's property. you're going to hear that this traffic is controlled. This is not haphazard criminal activity. This is organized criminal activity. And there's a hierarchy of organization involved in these trafficking enterprises. And you're going to hear that everything is controlled, including illegal migration. 
by these higher up drug trafficking organizations. You're going to hear that nothing goes through there. No drugs, no people, no nothing, no asylum seekers, no nothing, unless there's some sort of knowledge or approval from these organizations who control this territory. As such, you're going to hear that sometimes these organizations will retaliate against a guide, let's say, for various reasons. Perhaps this guide lost a load of drugs that he was supposed to deliver. <coughs> Perhaps this guy stole a load of drugs that he was supposed to deliver. Perhaps this guide talked to the wrong person, gave information to the wrong person. Perhaps this guide smuggled a little bit extra without permission. Smuggling extra without permission is not allowed either. This is all happening in the area of Mr. Kelly's ranch. This ranch is isolated, it's secluded. There are border patrol cameras that are out there looking at the national forest and looking at some of the properties out there. These cameras are not regularly pointed on Mr. Kelly's property. And the smugglers who use this area, they know how to avoid the cameras, they know how to go under the radar. Smugglers in that area are largely successful at what they do. Smugglers in that area are not keen to have a lot of extra police presence in that area. They've got a good operation going through there. They don't want people coming in there and messing that up for them. Mr. Kelly's property is a good corridor because it's right there north of where the wall ends, which is where people are coming through. And it's also right on the way to a road called Duquesne Road, which goes east to west out there. And that's a good pickup location. People who move drugs and people drop things off into a vehicle, the vehicle takes them somewhere else. Duquesne Road is known for a lot of that sorts of traffic. That's the knowledge that Border Patrol brings to the table about this area and about what's going on out there. Mr. Kelly and Wanda bring knowledge about this area as well, based on what they've seen and based on what they've done over the years. We mentioned too that Mr. Kelly and Wanda both feel less safe over, over time as they're on this property, as they're receiving this information, and as they're looking at more evidence. And on those campsites that I mentioned where they're finding water bottles, they're finding clothing, they're finding things like that, they're noticing differences in clothing too. They're noticing that there's a lot more camouflage that they're seeing now that they didn't used to see. They're noticing that these water bottles that people are carrying are painted black. So a plastic water bottle that's painted black to avoid reflecting off of anything, to further avoid detection. And they find carpet shoes all over their property on a pretty regular basis. The carpet shoes are, a, it's, it's a cut out piece of carpet that you put on the bottom of your shoe and then there's camouflage and Velcro that's sewn into the carpet to attach the carpet to your shoe. And they learn that these are tools that are also used by smugglers to try to avoid being tracked because Border Patrol tracks people and carpet shoes, hopefully for the smugglers, tend to avoid that. Carpet shoes are typically discarded when a person gets picked up because they don't want to be found with carpet shoes later because that looks pretty suspicious. And so you'll find groups of carpet shoes just dropped in various locations on Mr. Kelly's property at various times. And when Mr. Kelly runs into this, he knows there was a group out here of somebody doing something and they got picked up from here. Sometimes that's on his property, sometimes it's on roads near his property. It, it's a common occurrence for Mr. Kelly and his wife out there to have to deal with that. Things get very serious one, one, um, one time when Mr. Kelly is no longer on the property. Mr.
Mr. Kelly leaves because he and his wife have some property up in the White Mountains. Um, it has it has to be prepared before they can stay in it. A lot of things have to be dewinterized and stuff like that. But they like to go to the White Mountains in the summer times. Mr. Kelly's away at the White Mountains once when he gets a call from Wanda. And she says that something happened. She doesn't know what, but something happened. There's helicopters everywhere. She doesn't know what's going on. Mr. Kelly and Wanda eventually hear that somebody found a dead body near Mr. Kelly's property. And this is the body of a woman who's been discovered, he believes, in a car. He hears this little secondhand, thirdhand knowledge, so he's not sure exactly what happened out there, but he's very concerned. And one of the neighbors tells him that this woman was possibly murdered, and he stops what he's doing, he returns, and he goes back because he doesn't want Wanda to be by herself when all of this is going on. This is the environment that he finds himself in, and this is what he and Wanda are dealing with on a regular basis. They used to feel safe on their property. They don't feel safe on their property anymore. And there's a lot of scary things that are happening around them. They've called law enforcement before, and they know that it takes time to get out there. They have a good relationship with law enforcement. Mr. Kelly continues to report things that he sees including various cuts in his fences. Because back in the day, when you had family groups going through, they would go under the fences by the smooth <coughs> wire. Not anymore. Now his fences get cut pretty regularly. And his cows will get out, and he has to walk his fences to make sure that he can repair them and things like that. So he's scared every day on his property. And he needs to arm himself every day on his property to try to deter this, to try to protect himself. It's in this context that Mr. Kelly sends text messages that the state put on your screens in front of you during their opening statement. You're going to hear about some of Mr. Kelly's text messages, and the state's going to tell you that this shows that Mr. Kelly is just amping himself up to go do something. He's really getting ready to hurt somebody. He really hates people who are crossing his property, etc. I just want to get out in front of that a little bit and give you folks the context so that when you read those messages, you can understand what Mr. Kelly is saying. In those messages, Mr. Kelly's talking to a friend of his who lives up in the White Mountains. And in those messages, Mr. Kelly is sharing his feelings with his friend. And when men get together to share their feelings, as far as I know, maybe this is, doesn't mean anything, but when they get together to share their feelings, they don't typically say, hey man, I'm really scared on my property. There's a lot going on. I feel this is getting out of my control. I hope and pray that nothing will happen to me or my wife, but I'm really scared. <coughs> Maybe some men do that, but a lot of them don't. <laughs> a lot of them will say things like, hey man, I'm in a war zone over here. You know, give me some support, buddy. Or hey, guess what happened the other day? I was out there and they tell stories. They exaggerate. They go over the top to the point of even lying and making things up. They insult each other. They use self-deprecating humor. They talk about how they're too old to run away. I can't shoot straight, gotta shoot a lot of rounds, I'm too old. That's the sort of conversation that we're talking about. We're talking about private conversation between two guys. That's crude, that's over-exaggerated, and that could certainly be offensive in some company. What's also never intended to be seen by anybody. This is intended to be private. This is intended to be just a couple of guys who know each other, who have known each other for a very long time, who are trying to blow off steam because of the impossible situation that Mr. Kelly finds himself in. The evidence is not going to show 
that these messages show that Mr. Kelly is a mean or a violent person or that Mr. Kelly hates anybody. These messages do not take away from Mr. Kelly's compassionate heart. They do illustrate his fear and they illustrate his increasing concern about what's happening. They illustrate his knowledge that he might be encountered with something dangerous. They illustrate his fear of being discovered unarmed on his property. And they illustrate his fear of possibly being confronted by armed people on his property as he has been in the past. And then on January 30th of 2023, Mr. Kelly is confronted with this threat. January 30th starts out a day like any other day on Mr. Kelly's ranch. He goes outside, he does his chores, he's got his animals, he's checking on them. And then he goes inside to eat lunch. It's a late lunch, it's around two o'clock, something like that. His wife Wanda is in the house and she's playing with the cat when this happens. And Mr. Kelly's making his sandwich and he looks up and that's, he looks up and he sees something out of the windows in front of him. From where he's standing, and the state showed you that picture where they showed here's where the body was, here's the view that he got. Mr. Kelly's not standing on his patio when he looks up. He's standing inside his house and looking out windows. That view that the state showed you in that picture, that's impossible to see from where Mr. Kelly's standing inside of his house. You go outside on the patio, it's extremely difficult to see. Inside in the house, absolutely impossible. There's no way Mr. Kelly saw anything out there at that distance from inside his house. But he does see something from inside his house. He sees at least five people carrying large backpacks and carrying rifles. And they're going across his property. Window on the left, window on the right. He sees them going from left to right. He says, Wanda, be quiet. Call Jeremy Morcell. Call the ranch liaison, because he sees these people. That's the person who responds. That's the fastest person who responds to help. Wanda gets her phone. She calls the number. Mr. Kelly feels threatened when he sees these people walking across his property like this with those weapons. Mr. Kelly gets the ranch liaison on the phone. He tells the ranch liaison about what he's seeing. And then he hears a shot. He hears a shot fired. A single shot. He thinks it's the sound of a rifle shot. This happens so fast, but this single shot that he hears changes everything in his mind. He knows that something is happening outside, something violent, something dangerous. That single shot might not be the last shot fired. That might be the first of many shots that he hears. All of this processes through his mind in less than a second, just hearing that single shot Suddenly, everything is different. Suddenly, this might go very badly. Wanda's with him. She didn't hear the shot. Wanda wears hearing aids, and those were fading. And she doesn't hear noises that are happening outside like that, even when they're working to the best of their abilities. But Mr. Kelly heard that shot, and he knew that he and his wife were in danger. Time in a moment like that is really suspended and people start acting. There's not a lot of logical thought process. There's action. Some people freeze, some people act. And Mr. Kelly acted. He took action in order to protect himself and to protect his wife. Again, he tells Wanda, Wanda, call Agent Marcel. Wanda calls Agent Marcel. Mr. Kelly quickly says, I might be being shot at. I might be returning fire. I'm returning fire. Goes out. Agent Marcel describes this conversation as very quick. He says Mr. Kelly is excited. He says Mr. Kelly is obviously encountering something because he obviously is. 
He's inside his house. He cannot see the location where this body is discovered from there, but he's obviously encountering something. That means there's something happening out there that has nothing to do with the location of this body. There's something else happening. Agent Marcel has now been informed. Now Border Patrol and the Sheriff's Department are hopefully on their way. Mr. Kelly knows this. He knows law enforcement's coming, but he knows how slow their response time is, and he knows that the threat that he's encountering is the threat he's encountering right now. Wanda, stay inside. He tells Wanda to stay inside. Wanda is terrified. She stands in the living room in between the windows. She doesn't even want to look outside. She's frozen. She's scared. Mr. Kelly walks outside. He picks up his rifle while he goes outside. He sees his horse running at about 100, 150 yards away, beyond two fences. His horse is out there, running. His horse is Sonny. Sonny is spooked. Sonny doesn't like gunshots. Sonny heard that single shot, too, and he's running. He picked up on the danger, too. He's an old horse. He doesn't like to run, and he doesn't do it very often. But when he's scared, he runs. Mr. Kelly wanted to just go out onto the patio with his rifle to be visible so that people could see him and they would run away. They wouldn't encounter him. That was his plan. As he walks outside the metal porch door that he goes out, it shuts with a bang. It's a loud bang. The person who's in front of the group who's leaving turns, sees Mr. Kelly, and points his rifle at Mr. Kelly. This is another one of those moments, like hearing that single shot. He sees a rifle. A rifle is pointed at him. Mr. Kelly is threatened. There are armed criminals on his property. He's already heard a shot. Maybe another shot is about to be fired, and maybe it's about to be fired at him. He believes that his life is in imminent danger. He knows that Wanda is in the house behind him. He knows her life is also in imminent danger, and he has to stop the threat. He has to stop it from happening. He makes a split-second decision. He doesn't shoot this person. He doesn't use lethal force, even though he had every right to do so. He doesn't. He raises his rifle at an angle high up so that he knows he's not going to hit anybody, and he fires. He fires until the threat is gone. He fires until these people are on their way out and he knows that they're leaving. You heard the state talk about how Mr. Kelly's rifle had a 30 round magazine. It can be emptied in a matter of seconds. Mr. Kelly didn't empty his magazine, not even close. Mr. Kelly fired eight, nine shots and then he stopped. He stopped because the threat stopped. The threat was gone and he stopped. What he did to protect himself and to protect his wife was effective. These folks run away. <coughs> Wanda, she's inside the house. She can hear these shots. These shots are coming from close by. She can hear them. She freezes. She can't even look out the window. She's so scared that her husband might be out there dead. She doesn't know what happened. She doesn't know how long she stands there, afraid to look out and see what happened. She doesn't want to see his body when she looks out the window. She gets the courage eventually to look out. She doesn't see Alan. She's relieved. She sees him walking on the road towards the barn. He tells her he's okay. He says he's going to go check on his barn. And he walks in that direction to make sure that his barn is secure. He walks on his road to make sure people are gone and to make sure he and his wife are truly safe. As he does that, he has another phone call with Agent Morcell. He tells Agent Morcell that he saw these folks, and Agent Morcell asks him if Mr. Kelly was being shot at or if they were armed. Mr. Kelly says something to the effect of, it's too far away to tell if they are all armed, something along those lines. Agent Marcel interprets that as Mr. Kelly saying, now he doesn't say anybody is armed. Now he's changed his statement. This misunderstanding between Mr. Kelly and Agent Marcel is later used against Mr. Kelly. 
Unfortunately, the phone calls that Mr. Kelly has with Agent Marcel are not recorded, and so we're never going to know the exact words that Mr. Kelly used in this case. And this is the first of a very unfortunate theme in this case, the theme of words being changed, of meanings being misunderstood, of statements being twisted. And we will see this again. Agent Marcel, eventually, he sends his agents out there, the sheriff's department, they're going out there to investigate this offense, to see what's happening. They get out there and they begin to search the area. The deputies who are searching the area are themselves carrying rifles because they're told the nature of the call. There may be armed people, there may be shots fired, so they're taking precautions. The deputies walk all over Mr. Kelly's property. They fan out in this area near where Mr. Kelly said he was shooting. They spread out and they walk through it. They walk through the pasture that's out there, the yard. They go beyond Mr. Kelly's two fences, all the way back into where the wash is. Multiple deputies are out there searching that area. They're looking for people who might be hiding, people who might be hurt. They're looking for people who might be under trees or under bushes. They're looking in washes. They're looking for people who might be on the ground. And they don't find anybody. They don't find anybody who's injured or hiding. They don't find anybody who's dead or dying. They don't find anybody at all. They don't find any sign of the men that Mr. Kelly described or anybody else. Everybody's gone. They find Mr. Kelly, and then they briefly talk with Mr. Kelly about what happened. Deputies, a number of them, talk to Mr. Kelly. They talk to Wanda. They don't record their interactions. They don't you know, record the conversations. So we don't know, again, exactly what is said. And here we see words that get changed. We see differences in different reports. It's very unclear what was actually said. And because nothing was recorded, we don't know what was actually said. Nobody at this point did a thorough interview with Mr. Kelly or his wife. This was brief. They were generally searching for people. They didn't find any people. And when they figured we didn't find any people, there's really not much for us to do here. We'll document the incident and we'll go home. So nobody ever sat down with either Mr. Kelly or Wanda and said, talk me through this. Let's take this one step at a time. Let's go through this slowly. While you talk, I'll, I'll ask you some clarifying questions if I have them. If I, if I hear something that I think is wrong, I'm going to tell you, and you can tell me if I misunderstand that. Nobody ever did that at this point with Mr. Kelly or his wife. And nobody ever recorded any other interactions with Mr. Kelly or his wife out there. Law enforcement leaves. Mr. Kelly and his wife are spooked and exhausted from this incident. They're shaken, but they figure that it's over, and they're grateful that they're both unharmed. They think that's the end of it. This has already been a very long and traumatic day for the Kellys, but unfortunately, their nightmare's just beginning at this point. Later that evening, they think this is all over. Everything's over and done with. Later that evening, Mr. Kelly goes outside to check on his horse. He always brings Sonny, the horse, into the closer pastures in the evening, and this is part of his routine. He's checking on Sonny again because Sonny was very spooked during this incident, and he wants to make sure again that his horse, Sonny, is okay. Mr. Kelly's dogs, He's got two dogs. They go out with him. They go everywhere with him. Two dogs are always with Mr. Kelly when he's out on his property. He goes outside, and he's getting his horse taken care of and squared away for the night. And then he notices that his dogs are looking at something. His dogs are circling around something in the grass. And this is about 115 yards away from his house. This is outside of two separate fences. You go outside of the house onto the patio. There's a fence. 
there's a pasture, there's another fence. We're beyond the second fence, very far away from Mr. Kelly's house. He goes up to see what the dogs are looking at. And he approaches and he sees the body of Gabriel Quenbutimea. When he sees that body, he freezes. He, one of those moments again where time sort of stands still for Mr. Kelly. He thinks, oh my goodness. He's just discovered a body on his property. He sees his dogs sniffing and nudging the body. He notices the body seems to be stiff. And his background tells him this person might have rigor mortis of some kind. It's, he's stiff. He notices the dogs and he sees the limbs are stiff. The sun's going down at this point. It's almost dark. He, he's looking at the body. He sees this is a man. He sees this man is wearing a camouflage backpack. It's not a big backpack like the group that he saw earlier. This isn't in the place where he saw the group earlier. And he notices there's a camouflage fanny pack also next to the body, hanging down, not really attached to anything. And he's remembering that single shot that he heard earlier in the day before he went outside. That single shot is coming back to him. He's in shock. He stands frozen. He's never found a body before. He's never seen a dead person before. He doesn't know what to do, but a million thoughts are racing through his mind. He knows he fired shots earlier. He knows the body's on his property. He knows that somebody might be thinking to blame this on him. He is scared out of his mind. He's remembering again that single shot that he heard. He also knows there might be people around him. He doesn't know if he's alone. He doesn't know who else is out there. Obviously, tons of people were on his property throughout the day, and he doesn't know if anybody else is out there. He is scared. In spite of this fear, he calls for help. In spite of knowing, oh my gosh, this might come back on me, he calls for help. He does the right thing. He calls the ranch liaison because that's who he calls. That's the call that he makes whenever he's seeing something go on on his property. So he calls Jeremy Morcell, Agent Morcell. He has faith that this can be investigated Law enforcement will handle this, and everything's going to be okay. That faith turns out to be very misplaced. When he calls Agent Marcel, and again, no phone call to Agent Marcel is actually recorded. Agent Marcel remembers these conversations a certain way. Mr. Kelly remembers these conversations a different way. We don't know what was actually said because we don't have a recording. But he calls Agent Morcell. He says something, this is very bad. Send the sheriff out here. Send help out here now. According to Agent Morcell, he's saying something may have been struck earlier. That's what Agent Morcell says that Mr. Kelly says. Mr. Kelly's in shock. He's scared. He sounds serious. Agent Morcell has never heard him like this before. He says he doesn't want to talk over the phone. He still doesn't know who might be listening or who might be out there. Agent Marcel calls another Border Patrol agent. He calls an Agent Layugan, and he relays that information to Agent Layugan. Agent Layugan calls the Sheriff's Department and says something that influences very seriously the way law enforcement responds to this call. Agent Layugan whether on purpose or by accident, but in a very big way, changes Mr. Kelly's words. <coughs> Mr. Kelly, according to Agent Morcell, who spoke with Mr. Kelly, said, something may have been struck. I need you to, something may have been struck earlier. Agent Layugan takes that, and he says to the dispatcher, the homeowner's reporting, I may have struck something. He said, I may have struck something not what Mr. Kelly said. Makes a big difference though. Makes all the difference possibly. 
This is the first, not the last, example of words being changed. <coughs> this monumental statement goes to the dispatcher with the sheriff's department. This is the person who's responsible for telling the deputies who are going out there, responsible for telling them, here's what you're going to see, here's what you're going to encounter, this is the call that came in. So when she gets on the radio to tell the deputies to go out there, she's saying, you know, the homeowner says he may have shot someone. Now it's not may have struck someone, it's he may have shot someone. That's what the homeowner said, I may have shot someone. Not what Mr. Kelly said. That's what law enforcement hears when they're on their way to answer this call. And that affects the way the deputies approach this call when they get out there. The deputies are viewing this case one way and one way only. And this is their first step in the investigation. This big change influences and establishes the bias in the investigation against Mr. Kelly. The dispatch then calls Mr. Kelly to talk to him. You heard that call, and you're going to hear that call again. Mr. Kelly is nervous and in shock, but he answers the phone and he speaks to the lady who's doing the dispatch. Mr. Kelly cannot bring himself to tell her that there's a dead person on his property. He's scared. He's in shock. He's never found a dead body before. He can't say the words. There is a dead person here. I'm looking at a dead person. That's hard. It's very, very hard. They're not coming out. It's not working. So he tries to tell her a different way, and that call reflects that. He tells her he doesn't want to get in trouble. He doesn't want to get her in trouble. He says these things. He does. He says these things. And he says these things because in that moment of shock and fear of, and discovery, he's thinking, they might think I did this. They might think I did this. And he's right. And his fear is reasonable. So when he makes those comments in his shock and in his fear, and somebody who's not troubled by this wouldn't make those comments. Somebody who's not troubled by this would say, I found a dead body. He, he's troubled by this. He's scared. He doesn't know what to do. He's rattled beyond anything. Dispatch keeps asking him questions, and he communicates to dispatch that there is a body out there. He says it in so many ways without actually using the words, because he can't use the words. But you can tell from that phone call that he's struggling and he's trying to communicate this fact so that he can get some help. He says, there's the body of an animal, you know, as opposed to a vegetable or a man. You know what I'm saying. He's trying to get dispatch to acknowledge what he's saying. He's not trying to treat anybody like within an inhumane manner. He's trying to communicate the facts in the only way that he can to find the words to do so. Eventually, he references the dead woman, the woman that he and Mrs. Kelly had heard about on that trip when Mr. Kelly was in the White Mountains. He says, remember that situation. Come on, dispatcher. You're going to understand it now. Remember that situation. That's what we have here. You know, the body. Okay. Dispatch finally gets it. And he doesn't want to use this word either because he's still outside. He still doesn't know who might be around him or who might be listening. When dispatch sends out the deputies, she tells the deputies that Mr. Kelly was being evasive when he had this conversation with her. So that's another example of bias in this characterization of Mr. Kelly's words as being evasive. <coughs> She could have used a different word. She could have said, he sounds scared. He sounds like he's in shock. He sounds like he's afraid to speak to me directly. He sounds hesitant to use certain words. She chose the word evasive, and she spread that characterization to the deputies who were responding to the scene. So now the deputies think, we're going to go talk to this guy who's being evasive and who says he admitted he might have shot someone. Not at all the way Mr. Kelly reported this. 
But that's what the deputies are thinking when they go out there. When the deputies arrive, Mr. Kelly takes them to where the body is. And you'll note it, he has a conversation with Deputy Lopez, who's the first one out there on the scene who talks to him. And once law enforcement is there, Mr. Kelly says, there's a person, there's a body, there's a person, he is over there. He's, he uses that language now that he knows there's somebody else who's there on the scene. The deputies that get there can see that there's a single gunshot wound, a single shot going through the side of the body and coming out through the chest. All right. Um, sorry to interrupt you, but we do need to take an afternoon break. So we'll take the break now. Um, take about a 15 minute break. Um, I know some of you would have wanted to see the jury commissioner in the Plum Public Guzman, maybe about related to work and what you have to submit. So I'm seeing if he can come up now and talk to you for during this break. And if not, we'll put them together with you uh, first thing next week. All right, we'll take a 15 minute recess. We'll come back in about three o'clock. We'll they don't care. They've got their guy. They're not interested in other, other possibilities. Shortly after that, that's Miguel. Shortly after Miguel, you have Ramon. Ramon shows up. Ramon is picked up in, I believe, Sonoida for alien smuggling. He's trafficking people through somewhere, and Border Patrol picks him up. And after he gets arrested, he says, hey, I was there. I was there. They take a statement from Ramon. They talk to him. Ramon says some things that are concerning. He says he recognizes Mr. Kelly from the news. He says, I saw this on the news. And that's and I recognize him because I saw him on the news. I was I was there. He makes some more statements that contradict objective physical evidence in the case. Many such statements that contradict objective physical evidence in the case many such statements that are verifiably false based on what law enforcement knows about the scene and about what took place. Does law enforcement pursue that? Do they challenge Ramon? Do they consider Ramon to be a possible suspect? Do they ask questions about why now not one person but two people have come forward to say, Mr. Kelly did it, he's the bad guy, and those statements don't match up with anything and they seem to be false statements. Is that a concern for law enforcement? No, they have their guy. They don't need to worry about investigating other things. So we get Miguel, we get Ramon, then we get Daniel. Daniel comes forward in a very controlled manner. This is controlled by Gabriel's family and controlled by a supposed family member who goes by the name of Juan Carlos Rodriguez. That person somehow communicates with the sheriff's department and that person says, okay, we, we found someone. We have someone who was with Gabriel when he died. It's, it's this guy, it's Daniel. Okay. So the family arranges for Daniel to come talk to law enforcement about what happened. And then we have another strange thing occur in this case. The sheriff, Sheriff Hathaway himself personally, decides to get involved in this case. And Sheriff Hathaway himself personally, as part of this investigation, goes into Mexico to conduct this criminal investigation. And he goes in there, the evidence is gonna show twice. First time to just meet with the family members, uh, but he goes into Mexico to do that and doesn't document that meeting until much, much later. After he's told, you didn't document this, you gotta document this. And then he goes with another detective. So Sheriff Hathaway goes himself personally with a detective, Barba. They travel into Mexico to have this criminal investigation, to conduct this criminal investigation. The evidence is going to show that there's no legal authority for the sheriff to do that. 
The evidence is going to show that Sheriff Hathaway did not go through any diplomatic channels in order to conduct an investigation in Mexico. He didn't liaise with any Mexican official, didn't do anything. He just went into Mexico to meet with the witness at a hotel across the line. He went with Detective Barb, as I mentioned. Gabriel has two adult daughters who were present at the meeting. This Juan Carlos Rodriguez person was there. They're all in this interview with Daniel. That interview takes about 45 minutes. They talk to Daniel. They don't record that interview. After the interview is finished, Sheriff Hathaway records a summary of the interview. So he gets the witness to essentially say again, tell us again what you just told this detective, but now we're going to record you. That recording lasts six minutes. So that's the documentation that they did of the interview that took place in Mexico with Daniel. After that interview, Daniel provides numerous other interviews and Daniel testifies in a preliminary hearing in this case. Over the course of these numerous interviews, it becomes clear that DRR, Daniel, <laughs> I'm used to using his initials, Daniel, he continuously changes and adjusts his story. And it's also very apparent that Daniel is handled by whoever's interviewing him very differently from how Mr. Kelly was handled. If Daniel says something that's verifiably false, for example, he gets an opportunity to explain it. He gets an opportunity to clarify. And inevitably, if he is caught in an outright lie, which does happen, he'll claim that he just misunderstood the question. That's what, that's what he does. The evidence will show that he makes many claims that are in fact verifiably false and that his claims are never challenged. He's always given the benefit of the doubt. Daniel's claims are contradicted by numerous other pieces of evidence in this case that we, I want you to watch out for while you're hearing this, this evidence. He's contradicted by other witness statements. So Miguel and Ramon tend to contradict him as well as Mr. and Mrs. Kelly. He contradicts his own claims by changing what he says over time. And his claims are contradicted by the physical evidence in the case. I'm not going to go into every single inconsistency that Daniel has now. I just, while you're listening to him testify, I want you to ask yourself, how does what he says actually match up with the physical evidence in this case? And the evidence is going to show that his statements do not match up. The evidence is going to show that it's in fact impossible to believe that Daniel was present when Gabriel was shot. For example, right off the bat, Daniel says all of this happened west of Nogales. Mr. Kelly's property is east of Nogales. Daniel's asked numerous times, where did this happen? East or west of Nogales? West. Not possible. Daniel states that after he was shot, Gabriel fell over backwards and landed on his side or on his back after he was shot. Also, not possible. Bodies found on the stomach. So if DRR is telling the truth and he fell over backwards, then after Gabriel was shot, he, his body was turned over. And that changes everything too. It's not possible to believe what Daniel says. Daniel also says that right after the shooting took place, Mr. Kelly stood over Gabriel's body. That Daniel saw that. He looked back, he was close, he saw him. He saw Mr. Kelly standing right there over Gabriel's body. The evidence is going to show that that is not possible. Not only is this 115 yards away from where Mr. Kelly was when he was firing, in order for Mr. Kelly to stand over Gabriel's body, 
He has to climb over two barbed wire fences and cover that distance in a very short time at his age. That's not possible. The evidence is going to show that. The evidence is going to show that Mr. Kelly is actually seen on camera by Border Patrol in a very different area after this shooting happens. Nowhere near where Gabriel is found. Daniel also says that this shooting happened right next to the border wall. He says we were 15 meters away from the border wall. It was right there when this shooting happened. Not possible. This took place over a mile, or a mile and a half as the crow flies away from the border wall. Daniel also says that a horse was shot and killed in this incident. Not just shot, shot and killed. And he stuck with that, shot and killed and the horse fell down and I saw the horse fall down. Not possible. Daniel also says that Gabriel was not wearing a two-way radio. He says, I was there, I was with Gabriel. He was just a migrant looking for the American dream. He was not wearing a radio, not possible. Gabriel was wearing a radio. Daniel will also say that he and Gabriel, right before the shooting happened, they were right next to a road and he got specific. He said it's the road that Border Patrol uses to get to the end of the wall. It's the road that goes to the end of the wall. Not possible. There is a road that Border Patrol uses. There is a road that goes to the end of the wall. It's not on Mr. Kelly's property. It's further away. So not possible. There are many, many of these examples but we'll wait to see what Daniel actually has to say. The biggest three examples of these impossible statements are that the horse was shot and killed, that Mr. Kelly stood over Gabriel's body, and that this happened right next to the border wall. Those are huge. Those are not explainable by any conclusion other than Daniel was not there. Daniel did not witness this at all. There are other instances of Daniel misrepresenting things to law enforcement or changing his story as time goes on. At first, when he meets up with um, Sheriff Hathaway and Detective Barba, he says that Gabriel was the smuggler. Gabriel was leading the group. Later, he changed his story. No, Gabriel wasn't the smuggler. He just wanted the American dream. It was this other guy. I don't know his name. El Cholo. It was El Cholo. He was leading the group. That's what Daniel says. During an investigation where Daniel is talking to the detectives of the county attorney's office, they asked Daniel, have you ever transported drugs into the United States? Important question. I mean, see, see what this guy's background is. Have you ever transported drugs into the United States? Daniel says, no, never, I've never done that. Well, turns out he has. That was not true. He lied about that in this investigation. The defense's investigation revealed that Daniel had been convicted in federal court of transporting marijuana into the United States. He took a plea in federal court under oath where he admitted that he transported drugs into the United States. And he did some time in federal prison as a result of that offense. When he was confronted with this information later, I just misunderstood the question. I thought, I thought when you asked me, have I ever transported drugs into the United States? I thought what you meant was, did I have any drugs with me when I was with Gabriel? Does that go challenged? No. No, that explanation is perfectly accepted by law enforcement. Daniel also stated under oath that he had not met with anybody to talk about this case until he was testifying about it. That was not true. When he made that statement, he had already had 
two separate meetings with law enforcement to talk about the case. And whenever he's questioned about any of these statements, he just says, well, I misunderstood the question. I, I didn't get it. I, I, I didn't understand what you were saying. And law enforcement just accepts those explanations. Nobody from law enforcement ever doubted or questioned Daniel's story. Daniel's statements in this investigation were always accepted as fact, and they were never subjected to any kind of meaningful scrutiny. In fact, maybe you won't be surprised by this, but law enforcement changed Daniel's statements. They changed his words to make those words fit into their story. Daniel did an interview with a detective at the county attorney's office, and the detective was translating what Daniel said to the prosecutor. He was asked in Spanish, where did this happen, east or west of Nogales? He said west. The detective who was questioning him in Spanish said, oeste, west? Daniel said yes. The detective translated that east. He said east. That's a problem. This keeps happening in this investigation, and that is a problem. <clears throat> Never, in spite of all of this coming out, does law enforcement ever seem to question if they have the right guy. They never seem to question what is going on with this witness. I'm gonna leave Daniel for a minute here, but again, I wanna come back to the big three, the three things he said that are impossible to believe. A horse was shot and killed when this happened. Impossible to believe. Mr. Kelly was standing over Gabriel's body right after this happened. Impossible to believe. And this happened right next to the border wall, 15 meters away, impossible to believe. So keep that in mind when you're listening to this testimony, when you're evaluating this testimony. I wanna talk very briefly just about the forensics that you will hear in this case. Because eventually law enforcement gets around to doing some forensic analysis of the scene. And the evidence is gonna show there are some shell casings on the patio outside of Mr. Kelly's house. And the forensic evidence is going to show that there's a lot that we just can't know, that no, we just can't prove forensically. <clears throat> Biggest thing is there's no bullet. And when there's no bullet, there's no proof. We can't prove that Mr. Kelly's rifle fired the shot that hit Gabriel. We can't prove it. We can't prove that his rifle did not fire the shot either. You can't prove it either way. There's, there's nothing to hang your hat on forensically to say for sure, here's what happened or didn't happen in this case. The forensics can't prove or find out who fired the single shot, the shot that Mr. Kelly heard. Who fired that single shot that killed Gabriel? We don't know. Which direction did that shot come from? We don't know. You heard the state say that because bullet comes in here and it comes out here and he's lying on his stomach, well, it comes from the direction of the house. That's where it came from. We don't know that. We don't know how Gabriel was standing when he got hit. We don't know if he was standing when he got hit. We don't know if he took steps before he fell. We don't know if he perhaps fell over backwards, the way Daniel described it, and then was either rolled over or rolled over. We don't know any of that. There's no forensic evidence that can tell us this is how Gabriel was standing before he got shot, or even this is where he was before he got shot. We don't have that evidence. And who is Gabriel and what was Gabriel doing there? Again, there's a lot that's unknown about Gabriel, about who he is and what he was doing there. All we have is the evidence, and we look at that evidence. The witness, Daniel, says Gabriel's looking for the American dream. He's a migrant, he wants to work, and he's just traveling unarmed, doing nothing, and suddenly Mr. <laughs> Kelly starts firing at him. The physical evidence tells another story. The physical evidence shows that he's carrying a radio. 
you're going to hear about radios. He's carrying a radio. He's carrying camouflage. His backpack and his fanny pack are camouflage. The phone, Gabriel had a phone. They examined the phone. There are some photographs of Gabriel's activity on that phone. And you're going to see photographs of Gabriel on dates that are different from January 30th. You're going to see photographs of Gabriel from prior occasions on prior dates. In those photographs, you're going to see Gabriel wearing the same, same clothing. Same clothing he's wearing when he dies. He's wearing on other occasions, different occasions. You're going to see him carrying a fanny pack. You're going to see him carrying it in front of him, going across his body like that, not down at his side, not dangling off of his backpack carries it across his body. Photographs will show that. The photographs are going to show Gabriel standing up high on a mountaintop somewhere. Fanny pack across his chest. Radio. He's got his radio again on that date. Binoculars. He's carrying binoculars this time too. What's he doing? I think we can make an inference about that. So who is Gabriel and what's he doing on Mr. Kelly's property? Pictures are worth a thousand words. And the pictures show that Gabriel is not somebody who's looking for the American dream. This is somebody who is engaged in trafficking. He's engaged in <coughs> illegal activity. And I'm not talking about just coming across as an illegal alien. I'm talking about either scouting or smuggling trafficking people, trafficking drugs, we don't know. But he's trafficking. He's involved in that world. And at the end of the day, the evidence is going to show that Gabriel is living a criminal lifestyle, and criminal lifestyles are dangerous. The evidence will show that there's one shot fired before Mr. Kelly leaves his house, and Gabriel died as a result of one shot. One shot, one bullet hole. That's what the evidence is going to show. The person responsible for firing that single shot is also the person responsible for Gabriel's death that day. And that person is not Mr. Kelly. Law enforcement had a bias going into this investigation and they wrapped the evidence around Mr. Kelly. They decided he was guilty and they made it work. They didn't let the evidence lead them to their conclusions. They let their predetermined conclusions lead them to their interpretations of the evidence. And this is why at the end of this, we will be asking all of you to render a not guilty verdict in this case. We're asking that each one of you listen to each witness very carefully. You heard my co-counsel yesterday talk to you about they start with a clean slate, you take them as they are, you start with no preconceived notions, listen to what they say, compare what they say to the other evidence in the case. We're asking that you not make the same mistake law enforcement did. Don't start with the mindset that Mr. Kelly shot this person. Start with the mindset of wanting to seek the truth of wanting to go where the evidence leads, not the other way around. And we're asking you especially to consider the physical evidence in this case. Everybody has statements. Statements need to be tested against the physical evidence. That's the most important thing, the facts. Very particularly, we want you to understand the distance from Mr. Kelly's patio to where this body was eventually located. Pay close attention to all the photographs that you see, the drone footage that you see of this property, and pay close attention to the number of obstacles that are in between where Mr. Kelly was standing and where Gabriel was eventually discovered. You're going to see pergola uh, legs, you're going to see smokers. You're going to see many, many trees. You're going to see wood piles. You're going to see fences. 
you're going to see dozens and dozens of obstacles in between where Mr. Kelly was standing and where Gabriel's body was eventually discovered. And you're, you know what you're not going to see in any of those obstacles. You're not going to see a bullet hole. You're not going to see any lead residue, any of those obstacles. The state is going to try to convince you that Mr. Kelly fired nine shots through this field of obstacles with the intent of hitting Gabriel, who he can barely see from the patio and who he can't see from inside the house. The state is going to try to convince you that nine shots went through this field of obstacles and left no bullet holes and no lead residue. There's a broken branch in this field of obstacles, a single broken branch. This is a pasture. This field of obstacles is in a pasture. Animals all over this place all the time. In that broken branch, again, there's no bullet hole, there's no lead residue, there's no evidence whatsoever that that branch was hit by a bullet. There's no evidence that any bullets went through this field of obstacles, let alone nine of them. So keep the physical evidence in mind, keep the forensic evidence in mind when you're listening to witnesses tell their stories. Keep other witness statements in mind to compare with the witnesses that you're hearing. And keep the known facts of the case in mind to, to have in mind when you're listening to people testify. The facts that can't be disputed. Have those in mind when you're listening to the witnesses. The state in this case is going to ask you to speculate about motives and meanings. He sent this text message. Here's what he meant. This is what he thought. This is what he felt. They're going to ask you to make subjective determinations about what certain phrases mean. They're going to ask you to make subjective determinations about what somebody feels or what somebody thinks. We're not going to ask you to do that. We're going to ask you to not speculate. We're going to ask you to rely on the facts of this case, the facts, the things that we know. And finally, before I wrap up, I just want all of you to remember, co-counsel talked about it yesterday, but remember who has the burden of proof. This table has the burden of proof. This table has to prove to you, prove to you, that Mr. Kelly shot Gabriel. We don't have to prove that he didn't. And we don't have to prove that he's innocent. All right, it's their job to prove that he shot Gabriel. And they can't do it. And remember why the burden of proof is the way that it is. We're asking you at the end of this trial, after hearing all this evidence, to render a not guilty verdict. And I thank you very much for your time.